week, we welcome back the one and only, the legendary, the man himself, the co-originator of permaculture, activist, author, philosopher, parent, teacher, many hats, the one and only David Holmgren. Thank you very much for being here. Well, it's good to speak to you again, uh, Gordon, after some time. Yeah, it goes quick. <laughs> this old time business, it definitely goes quick. Uh, so we're speaking today uh, about a remarkable little film that uh, I watched last night that you guys have put together called Reading Landscape. And I want to talk about the uh, the origin of it and then and then go into into some of the meat uh, of this this wonderful project. So, I mean, let's begin there. Um, where, how did did this project originate? Yeah, it originated with a uh, colleague, Dan Palmer, who got me involved in a permaculture design project he was involved with. Uh, it was a large scale rural design. And at that stage in his work, um, that was fairly new for him. And he brought me in to do some reading of the landscape to get interpretation of the geology and other features and that he didn't feel he fully understood from all the contour mapping and other stuff that he'd done on the site. And he was so excited by what came out of that process that he would, or became enthusiastic about recording me reading the landscape. And it was also for me after decades of being passionate about reading landscape as a fundamental skill for permaculture design and also how to communicate and educate people about this because it's not about here i'll tell you something i know it's about enlivening our innate abilities to read landscape in the same we have innate abilities to read people. And ironically, Dan Palmer uh, gave me a bit of a breakthrough because he was reading me reading the landscape. And he uh, gave some uh, terminology even to describe what I was doing. Um, and so that intensified our partnership and then you know he sort of talked about making a film and you know then there was involvement um, from someone who'd been a student uh, of his who was a filmmaker and they were spending time together and had been involved in other possible uh, documentation projects and so that emerged from there with Dave Ma the the filmmaker and it was a very organic project. And I suppose I was the primary subject, but we were also involving progressively other people, uh, both with me reading the landscape and others in, in different ways. Uh, so very much the, the film was Dan Palmer's uh, project rather than my, mine, I was sort of the subject of it and, and sort of to an extent did what I was told or, or felt led by him in that project until uh, last year when yeah. the project was, a, a lot of it was uh, coming to get together and of course we'd had a, a crowdfunding to support uh, because it had become bigger than a purely pro bono project. And uh, you, of course, were involved um, in uh, helping that uh, sponsor the film. Yeah, I remember talking to Dan about this, uh, this idea, you as the inspiration uh, early on, because how he described it to me was watching David on country. There is you you have to go back to pre-colonial times to find someone who has that much experience with that specific piece of country that, that where you were talking about where you and Sue have lived for the last few decades and worked 
And that he was really electrified by the idea of, because I remember in the early discussions, we have these two words, reading landscape. And one of the things the film does so well is uh, situate uh, the the good and the bad of that term. And what I, mm. by bad, I mean shortcoming, because reading implies a literacy and landscape implies a way of seeing the world as, as something that's external and flat rather than something in which we participate. And all of this was going around in, in Dan's head, uh, and he was explaining it to me quite excitedly, to see someone who, like yourself, who has... And, and it comes from a depth of, ex of experience. Like, it's it's from the actual doing it. And struck by... Your um, your expertise um, is definitely transferable around the world, but it's a it's a particular kind of power <laughs> where you are, where you know the um, the endemics, where you know what the the weather patterns are like over the, the times of years. You know the the geology and the topology, and that really struck him. So we, as a collective, as a society, or whatever we are, aren't very good. Well, historically, we've been better at it. At the moment, <laughs> at the moment, we're not very good at it. And that really appealed to me as this idea. Uh, reading landscape is is a is a practice and an invitation to sit with even what we mean by both of those words. Yeah, there's definitely something in that for me from the beginnings being inspired by my work with Bill Wallison and then shortly after that uh, my, someone who I regard as my second mentor in permaculture, ironically, um, Hakai Tane in New Zealand who, who really lit the spark for me recording my readings through uh, using a camera to the extent that that's actually possible. And of course as someone who's uh, a visually dominated person in a culture that's visually dominated, then reading also implies the sight. And that's one of the limitations of the term too, because it's in fact all the senses that we're drawing on. And uh, the, obviously in more recent times, the uh, indigenous use of the English word country to describe something perhaps different from landscape, which maybe given the cultural lineage implies some separation uh, of observer and observed. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Which uh, means I'm going to ask you uh, a, a sort of mean question in, in, its, in its difficulty early on in the interview. But David, how does one read landscape? Well, firstly, slowing down and sitting with it, being in place. And that what you referred to earlier as, as sort of knowing a lot about a place uh, in the modern world, being in place, even just waking up most days and staying and not being teleported in a fossil fuel powered magic machine to another place for the day is actually increasingly a rare experience for most people. So the whole thing of being in place on country uh, and doing things slowly uh, and sensitively and curiously without judgment of good or bad uh, and an open inquiry without specific goals, without I've got to find out this so I can do this or so I can find out what I should do. At the same time as being in a small way practically involved in a working in a working relationship with nature through gardening through relating and being dependent on the weather for what you do through all of the ways that our ancestors were connected to the environment and unlike uh, most of our modern lives that are in the 
insulated from that in the technospheric bubble. So I think that process of reading landscape is most efficiently learned basically as a baby, uh, exposed to the natural environment. And then as a child, being able to explore and interact with that, even in destructive, small ways, unregulated, undirected by adults. Uh, now that process, uh, which was a normal background for people who then, whether they became farmers or whether they became soil scientists or politicians or teachers or um, nurses, people once had that osmotic absorption to some degree of those skills. But modern people have been so sort of separated. So there's a process of attempting to remedially learn these things. And of course, we can do that and accelerate that to some degree by all the secondary sorts, sources of information, books, videos, um, being told by experts what something is. I suppose, ironically, those things in themselves and all the things we can rapidly learn from secondary sources of information can undermine our own innate journey of uh, discovery. So it's a really tricky problem for modern educated people. How do you do this? Um, other than to say, oh, well, we need to start with the next generation. And even yeah. that, the process of raising children requires us to completely change the way we see things and, and what we do and discard a lot of, you know, the norms of society. Well, see, I think that's key because it strikes me in one of the other uh, things I enjoy about the film is the uh, bringing it to the centre, because it's an Australian film, obviously, with, uh, with some uh, New Zealand cameos, um, the centrality of a Indigenous or First Nations perspective. Because what I sit with, what, I, what you were talking about there that I love is an invitation to unpack the word reading even more. There are sensory capacities, and even that word is not correct. Let's just say human capacities that every other people around the world, including our own ancestors not even that long ago, used and were aware of that a, a contemporary society has um, declared by fiat isn't true. And we can be confident that I would say we're wrong <laughs> about that. And these capacities are in fact there. There's some lovely moments we can see for people who are watching this on their video version. We can see Sue in the background, Sue telling stories of the early days of Meliodora um, when she was pregnant and obviously not much use in an in a earth moving project at that point. Uh, and, and just being on country, on the land, underneath the tree and, and, and having just by being quiet, in the place that became your home and having what emerges uh, and allowing what is ready to emerge in her experience, in her body, in her mind, to come up via that process. Now, I think it's behind me. Let me see if I can find it. Um, come back to it. There's a, there's a fantastic, for people, uh, international audience, there's been some fantastic books by Aboriginal authors over the last few years who talk about this process of, uh, one of the words for it is dadiri, so deep listening, uh, mm -hmm. and, and the notion that country can be treated or can be experienced as something like a library, where it actually contains, and this is where the word reading invites me back in, right? Mm -hmm. Where um, when we talk about reading landscape, it invites us to look at the shortcomings of the word reading, but also how we can make it bigger again by learning from, from other people and, and, and learning from peoples who experience country as, as a font of, of wisdom and intelligence. And that, it, that shows up in the film in a way that I think is really lovely. Yeah, it's a, it's a controversial question that comes up, of course, of how come you as a, a middle-class, uh, older white guy who 
wasn't even born in in, in that place, um, you know, is embedded in this country. And what is the um, the reference to uh, learning from indigenous uh, culture? And I suppose my answer to that is this film as constructed and focused by Dan Palmer is about that journey of how as uh, growing up in the suburbs in middle class Australia, uh, not particularly with parents who are deeply immersed in country relative to their generation, how did I come to this? So it's, uh, and that that context for someone born in 1955, coming to central Victoria in 1985, and not even being aware whether there were any surviving people from the Holocaust of the gold era that devastated this region and the people here more rapidly and intensely than arguably anywhere else in Australia. And in a way, like Tasmania, the whole discovery of, oh, there are Indigenous people, uh, that was happening uh, when I was in Tasmania. In fact, my co-originator, Bill Mollison, was responsible for doing the genealogy of the Cape Barren Islanders and, sh and showing to the authorities that they actually were Indigenous Tasmanians. And, you know, I met some of them at that time. Coming to central Victoria, you know, I now know there were 20 surviving people who uh, were the forebears of the current people, you know, connected to this country who are rediscovering, reclaiming uh, words. And I think um, uh, that's sort of shown in the... Uh, in the film, and that's a, a learning process that I'm going through like like other people. But again, that is, can be fall back into, oh, we need to learn from the elders, the experts. And myself as a do-it-yourself, self-starter, disrespectful of my own societies, authority structures, expertise, didn't naturally come here and say, oh, I need to learn from the people who are the experts and elders. I found through process, older fourth generation people um, who I learned from too, by serendipitous processes in this landscape. But those are those secondary sources and it's important to, I think, be respectful of those, but they're not actually what reading landscape um, no. is. And I think um, reading uh, uh, oh, uh, the, the um, fire um, indigenous writer from Northern Australia, whose name just... Uh, Victor Stephenson. Uh, Victor Stephenson. Uh, his book and the way he, as a young Aboriginal man from different country, was taken by the elders uh, um, and taught. But what he, they also taught him is that the country will teach you. And he says that in many ways in, in, in the book. And clearly that for Indigenous people... Uh, especially those reconnecting to ancestral country, but more generally to uh, the original Australians, there is a huge connection there. But it is also possible for settler peoples who were Indigenous originally somewhere <laughs> to, to rekindle that direct uh, yeah. experience. And we all need to do that. We do, and I'm very interested in that, in that um, that divide or that edge land, right? Because um, I'll tell you a story of a 
a Maori friend of mine actually, and and his experience that is relevant to this. But we're at a point where uh, we, it's almost like a loop where we have to, if we say we're going to take, and we do, into indigenous epistemologies, indigenous cosmovision seriously, when they talk about the country will speak to you and we would like country to speak to you because you're getting a lot of things wrong. We actually have to do it. And, and, and the idea of keeping it respectfully like, oh, we shouldn't do it because it's not our practice is actually keeping us trapped in keeping everyone trapped in the wound that is the, the presentation of that colonial mindset. It looks, it's deceptively the quote unquote right thing to do to step back from this learning because they say, well, that's, you know, that's not mine. And, and, and I can understand why people would, why that might come from the right place, but it's this funny loop where actually, well, if indigenous elders are saying, here is how we speak to country, here is how we are speaking to country, here is how you can. And it looks something like a thing you had as a capacity, as, a, as an ancestor. It's, it's, it strikes me that the obligation to learn from country however one lives um, is, is there. And it's this loop, right? Like you, you have to kind of, you have to step into it wholly. It's like, okay, well, if this is, if this is what indigenous frameworks and intelligence are, then I'm going to actually do it rather than step back and look at it as that museumified form. And it's, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that it's, it, um, there's a tension for people in, in actually making that step. I have a, um, I have a friend of mine, Mata Farrow Lloyd, he's Na Ariki Kaiputahi, so southeast of the North Island. And he, I write about him in my book. He's, he, came, he had a career in IT in Auckland and then he came back to his family land. And on the hill where they live, there's the ancestral pass site that was destroyed about 120 years ago, halfway down. And for six months, he sat there every night listening to place, listening to his ancestors to see if it, if it was his to do. He felt very called to bring it back into a living context. And eventually he got the okay and started doing it. And he didn't know, no one knows how to build a, a, a par site, right? No one knows the measurements of things. And, and so he started doing things like using his arm as the measurement for the twine for the fence, figuring that his ancestors probably would have used that. And I, I'm really struck by how that's hermetically true because the, the, the Western length would be different, but the arm length is exactly the same. Like mm. it is the length of one arm of that resident. Yeah. And he's very much like the same thing. This is, we listen to country, we listen to spirit and, and bring it back. And that's, I think that's where permaculture is. It's, it's now exploring that tension because funnily enough, it's a pattern. Like <laughs> it's a pattern that we just hadn't noticed before. It's a, it's a human capacity that's involved. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. These uh, um, things are deep within us and need to be, uh, rekindled and that can come in all sorts of ways I mean I would describe myself as as growing up being a super rationalist and my journey in reading landscape has very much been I suppose you could see it akin to the lineage of uh, the naturalist leading to the the biological or natural scientist you know, studying things, but but also engaged as as a practitioner, as a land manager, um, as someone responsible for doing things, uh, not just observing. And those that journey has brought me slowly to uh, progressive exposure to some of those things you're looking alluded to that our culture uh, just dismisses. And I don't see myself as, you know, particularly intuitive or connected to the esoteric, but through the process of rational science in its most holistic form, you come back to the logic that the land is alive, the rocks are alive, that there is consciousness in some form in everything and the echoes of everything that's been done in the landscape in the past going back millions of years is still present so that um, gradually 
that process has shifted my thinking and to some extent, because I'm a, a thinker and a rationalist, the idea of it sort of has come into my thinking more easily than the strong intuitive connection to those things. But certainly uh, Sue has managed to point me to evidence that some of my design and my thinking is actually informed by intuitive responses as well. I was about to say, that's what you have Sue for. You don't need... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's also, uh, I had a, a deep lesson, shocking lesson in that from Hakai Tane in New Zealand in 1979, when as two designers were laying out a site for some uh, Easter workshops of people who are coming in and camping and where the camping would be and the camp kitchen and the uh, sauna by the, the mountain stream and car parking. And we're just running through this whole um, site design. And we got to a point where there was some decision and we threw up all these options. Uh, these two, uh, two options emerged and we couldn't sort of really decide. And he said, oh, this is a case for the coin. And he pulls out a coin, <laughs> and flips the coin. And I'm sort of shocked from, as a rationalist, that could I make a decision by flipping a coin? And he gave me a, a long lecture about the I Ching <laughs> and the whole process, um, the various psychological aspects of uncovering what your emotion is to the, the random choice and all sorts of other aspects of it. Um, so, you know, over the years I've had those, uh, you know, various uh, lessons and, and, and occasionally those lessons have also come from Indigenous people in, in different places over, uh, uh, over the years. But for me, they're all windows into all oh, that other, other ways of understanding things. It's funny. I think it, I, I'm sure Sue's correct that it'll show up in your designs without a, a conscious awareness of it. Are you familiar with? He was a uh, died recently. Stephen Howard Buna, a very famous herbalist and, and herbal teacher. And and what he would do, what he would do with students who were very absolute beginners, uh, would he put uh, this one would get rosemary, this one would get whatever plants in front of them, and say as long as they didn't know which one it was, and just get them to give me your impression of this plant. Like what's its personality? What does it feel like? And what do you think it might be good for? And people will swear up and down that they cannot do this, that they cannot tell what these plants are traditionally used for in herbalism. And so they'll, they, they think they're guessing. And two thirds of them get it right. So it's about 66% get it right with plants they have no knowledge of whatsoever. What's interesting to me about that is that that 66-ish percent, if you know anything about like remote viewing and telepathy and so on. That's about the accuracy rate for something like remote viewing. So it, it suggests that there is this human capacity that um, other cultures or other life ways have, have been better at um, safeguarding and activating. So that uh, we, this comes back to who gets to own this idea. Not That's a, a mean way of saying it. Um, but who, who is this notion of reading landscape available to? we have in our own lineages the, the tantalizing, and our own experience, the tantalizing suggestion that these are human capacities. These are, these are things that have something to do with just how we are as, as people without it needing to be quite, although it's almost Halloween, without it needing to be quite so esoteric. Yeah. I mean, I suppose over the years, I, as uh, a skeptic, and that word, of course, is highly contaminated uh, sure. these days. But you know, I would look at people, you know, as a sometimes as a consultant, and people saying, you know, oh, we bought this land, we came here, and it just felt, it, you know, this was exactly the right place for us to be. And I thought, oh, yeah, it was a sunny day in spring, and you know, so distinguishing that sort of 
deep intuitive experience from very superficial emotional um, um, triggers that we are susceptible to and respond to uh, and that it's actually very hard on the surface to actually tell one from the other. And of course, there's parts of ourselves, you know, with our desires and our judgments and everything that are sort of constantly um, uh, tricking us. <laughs> and from the outside, it's almost impossible to, to me, to necessarily distinguish those things, but uh, I think they are, they are different. I would, oh, they're certainly different. Uh, one of the things that I spoke to Montefero about when I was I was back there in July, actually, and the process of listening to country for him, that those are my words, obviously, um, it's more likely to be authentic to your point. Like, is this, have the land spirits told me to build a Ferris wheel? Like, probably not. You could discount that one. But but the 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 intuitive messages come step by step. So you, you don't get given the whole vision. You get given, put that there. That was what it was for him. You get like, oh, you can you dig this hole. And he uncovered some fascinating things as he was building the, um, the fares. He was guided to dig a hole in one of them to make like, a, and put hot rocks in it and then put various healing plants in as, as some kind of steam bath. He said, I don't, like, I don't think our people did this, but he was guided to, so he dug it. And one of his uh, cousins, who is a like a Maori historian at University of Waikato, I believe, was coming by to see it, and he pointed to it and said, "Oh, that's a, I can't, I don't know, remember the word. That's a blah blah blah. That's one of our, um, our healing pits. That's what we would use to steam." So he built something that he didn't know, and it was because the um, the place spirits or whatever you want to call them for this past site didn't give him the overarching vision. They told him, "Dig here." Um, there, there's, for me, how I would describe it is you're more likely to be getting a, a, a true inspiration if it doesn't follow uh, human logic, <laughs> if it doesn't follow like, human patterning, if it's, if it's more short term, like do this and then have it open up. And it strikes me, this is just a take, it strikes me that this is because if you do one, if you do one thing and they uh, realize, whoever they are, you know, um, if you listen, oh, he listened. He, he got that one thing. We'll give him two things next. Like it's, it's almost like it is a, a, a ham radio or something. Like if, if they can tune in, then they'll give you the next one rather than just laying out like this, this, this grandiose plan. And that, I think, just as a, a contribution to the discussion, is how when it comes to navigating with intuitive processes, what it is like for me is like you don't get the whole vision you're just like i'm i this this is supposed to go here <laughs> right and and it opens up from there yeah well i suppose in my own processes of of finding uh some connection or some pattern um and developing some hypothesis about why are those trees growing there but not there um those questions often end up just sitting uh, and you don't have an answer or you gain some sort of idea, but it raises more questions. Mm -hmm. So whether that process is, is being aided by other beings, entities, agents, and uh, or whether it's internal, there's this process that Dan Palmer was very much exploring in his living design process that you each stage of doing something is recognizing that that a place is not a blank slate yeah. it's actually already a whole and uh, doing something to it is maybe differentiating uh, unfolding something but at each stage a living design process like a living entity going from seed to plant is a whole thing it does it's not it's not assembled and we've got all the pieces and we assemble it so in in some senses there's that unfolding of knowledge where you don't know what the next 
step is you don't actually have the whole plan and that was also an exploration with him that we were exploring my own design processes through uh, courses and teaching we were doing that included the very rationalist plan everything on paper um, you know think it through make the mistakes in the virtual before doing and uh, all of that sort of conventional design and this also this other process that comes very slowly and uh, unfolding and I see that second process as, as very much related to reading landscape as well whereas my initial incentive and focus was to be able to go onto a piece of land especially as a consultant and to be able to advise people from one day on site where they're going to put a house where the road should go damn these frighteningly big questions while well, just one visit because those were the realities of uh, of trying to uh, earn a living providing people with useful information and uh, help them make at least fewer mistakes <laughs> uh, and uh, so that how do you gather and absorb that um, possibility to make those big decisions and, and, and think ahead but uh, obviously at its best it's sort of actually at a, a much slower unfolding process there's, i'm glad you mentioned that because there's a line that i wrote down when i was watching the film last night uh from you permaculture projected itself into the world via the landscape consult uh and it's a very interesting turn of phrase that I, when i heard that and I, i'm it, that's historically correct but it's like oh this this is what we're talking about here that's 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 this one statement that has a it has a whole lot underneath it <laughs> because it's at least it's for better and for worse like like that's how it was right it, and it i guess it kind of brings up one of the things watching the film which was lovely was seeing like super early before meliodora became meliodora um pictures of where you guys live and one of the things i wanted to ask you because there's a there's a there's a shot of a tremendous amount of earthworks uh on the land at the very beginning and I mean, I, I don't know the initial context, obviously, or what it looked like at the time, but this this um, propensity for earthworks was one of the early, I guess, criticisms, um, and and valid to the like, let's say, permaculture 1.0 back in the day of like mm. showing up and going right, swales, dam, let's do it on contour, bam, 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 <laughs> book, yeah. book the book the earth movers, uh, knowing or, or having gone on this reading landscapes journey. I mean, for people, you, you'll see it in the film, Meliodora is this dimension's Rivendell, like it's, it's fantastic. And you guys have done an incredible, incredible job um, dwelling and, and sharing that place as a, as a, this, this amazing teaching and, and, and uh, inspiration. Would you have done some of that early stuff different with the benefit of, of, of the intervening decades of, of experience and contemplation and so on yeah i think so uh not uh, i don't have sort of major re regrets or, or regrets about uh major de decisions and i suppose i had been what well, came here in 85 i spent more than a decade obsessed with this whole permaculture project and design and doing these things I developed a property on the far south coast of New South Wales with my mother that involved earthworks and passive solar building and uh, uh, and ecological forestry and all of the infrastructure for her to have productive food gardens in, in a new uh, rural property so when I came here, there was both the energy of having gone through this decade focused uh, on all of these things and then 
several years of homing in on central Victoria and Hepburn Dalesford and learning everything I could about this country that led to this piece of land and uh, about community and connection. So there was a sort of like the piece of land just wasn't something that appeared. It was a sort of a homing in, a, a localising down. But coming here in a context where Sue was giving up her, her job effectively as an Italian interpreter in the city to move to the country, we were dependent on my micro uh, business as a permaculture consultant, uh, two pre-teenage kids coming out of school and a baby on the way and a limited set of savings and no loan from the bank. And it was go. You yeah, need sure. to do this, that urgency. And also a piece of land, which while I thought it was incredibly special, was incredibly damaged. Yeah. Uh, there'd been a sawmill here in the 50s and 60s, and then they bulldozed all the debris to fill the erosion gully and, you know, done some crude earthworks. And then the town had been sewered, uh, was still being in the process of uh, sewerage lines being installed. And the stuff that was done through our place was early on in that period and was real cowboy earthworks, all the topsoil buried in the trenches and clay spewed out over the ground. You know, there were so many things about this place that said, like, that freedom to work with it, even though there were also special things on the place in certain parts, uh, like the old uh, ancient pear tree <laughs> from the uh, 19th century, from the 1860s, actually, and the, and the well and the site where someone had lived once. No one had lived on the land since the 1860s. Uh, you know, so all of those factors coming together um, made me, yes, I am breaking the rules that ideally I should be sitting with this much longer. Um, but also that confidence that uh, that's what all this work has been for, for yeah, exactly. more than a decade. And you have to apply it and you have to make mistakes in the process. But when those mistakes are things you do yourself within, even with fossil fuel power, but within the limited budget of savings, as opposed to a corporation with massive bank finance, the scale of uh, mistakes are actually part of a learning cycle for society. And if we think about there's orders of magnitude difference in the scale of mistakes we can uh, make and we see being made uh, around us. So I think, yeah, I was definitely in the state of mind that, um, you know, to, to make an omelette, you need to break eggs <laughs> as well. Well, so th th here's the thing about mistakes, right? Like, in your, yours and Sue's context is a little bit different because whether we do this as a mere intellectual exercise or whether this is some kind of true, when David Holmgren, and this is something that Dan would have agreed with, goes out onto someone's property for a consult, and we joke that, yes. I think the, the problem with the landscape consult model is that you do your two-week course and, and hang out your shingle, and then off you go telling someone... Oh. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's, that's the error. When David Holmgren does it, what's actually happening is, um, and this is what I mean by we can do this as an intellectual exercise or it's true, the spirits of country that have taught David are then speaking to another part of country through him when he's doing the consult because you have that experience of what these species assemblies are here and what, what this pattern is and so on. And it's so... Meliodora, I mean it literally in the sense that it is a Rivendell because it's a place that when David and Sue make mistakes, that undoes in the future dozens or hundreds of mistakes that don't need to be made. 
right? So there's, it's, it's a special case and it comes back to that idea of, um, yeah, is this just an exercise or when, is there, how to say this right? When we do something like a consult, we can step into a frame where it has been country who has taught us and it falls to us to be the conveyor of that information to elsewhere on country. And that opens up, I think, I think if we step into that, it changes, I think different things will emerge, right? I, I think then we, we, we would think more like David Holmgren at that point, because we're actually much more in that uh, observation space rather than falling back on, on um, our panicked memory of what goes in what zone, right? Like we can, we can actually listen. And that, that's very interesting to me when we step into a flow model, which is one of those patterns where it's your experience with country. So country's taught you. And then it, it's like country speaking to country through you. <laughs> does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, when, I, when you uh, asked me about uh, mistakes, those early things and those big impacts with earthworks uh, still feel really strong. But ironically, the, the strongest sense of uh, mistake uh, was a decade later actually with the soil and as some of the um, processes by which the uh, improvement and balance in fertility started to peak and, and go into some degree of decline, that my responses to that uh, showed up um, that pattern that many people like myself, who think very strongly and have I ideas that you can start to see things through your own ideology, your own uh, theories, your own hypotheses about what the thing is, and that you can easily become blind to something that's sitting right yeah. in front of you. And I made one of those big mistakes that, you know, and it was around the overuse of dolomite lime uh, right. and the, its impacts on on the soil and that led to a whole learning journey, but also a very slow recovery process because of the particular nature of that particular mineral and its uh, powerful uh, reshaping of soil tending to make soil clump together and be more clay-like uh, rather than open and friable so that that effect can actually sort of persist over over time. So that's an example of what I experience as uh, a great mistake and uh, a sort of like, why couldn't you see <laughs> the signs that, that were there? Um, and you could say, well, I didn't have enough knowledge i hadn't consulted the right people i hadn't done the soil tests and uh, you know various uh, you know various things but um i was also not seeing the signs that were actually in front of me so i, I would probably uh, regard that as my sort of greatest mistake uh, here at Maliadora, and um, that is an interesting one because it connects to the whole mystery of soil fertility and what is it, and uh, it's such an area which is so complex from a scientific point of view, and um, and those processes by which people find that sweet point that often is expressed as, oh, that person's got a green thumb, that actually understanding how the soil is has reached a sink where things are working generally comes about by all sorts of processes that, are, that include the intuitive and the serendipitous and, and chance. And things can spiral um, into greater soil imbalance, and they can also stabilize around a, a natural fertility that self that, that can be 
to some extent self-feeding then. And those two different dynamics can be informed by both, yes, science and information and uh, detail, but they can also be informed by other processes, including things that we we don't understand at all. And uh, the soil stuff is is still unfolding. Uh, it's uh, yeah. amazing how how rapid and radical the shift in soil science has been over the last 30 or 40 years. And it's ended up confirming most of the understandings of organics and increasingly even ideas like uh, biodynamics that were seen as, as complete uh, scientific nonsense in the past. Exactly. So when I think about reading landscape, I know one of the things you've been interested in over the years is I guess changing affordability patterns is, is one of the things that happens with us where we are as a society and, and at this point in it, right? Because uh, famously you wrote Retro Suburbia and it's a deep exploration of uh, what we can do where we are amongst other things. And this is what I think about reading landscape, like fundamental affordability has changed yet again, even since uh, Retro Suburbia. <laughs> and it's like, I was thinking about this the other day. Well, actually, last night after, uh, there's an inversion now uh, 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 where it used to be that you could live cheaper in the country than you could in the city, that you actually could still get like an $8,000 bit of land. Now, in you can still, last time I looked, which was two or three years ago, you could still get a rundown house in Queenstown, uh, Tasmania. It was one that was for sale for $11,000. But that's it yeah. <laughs> right so i'm really interested in what 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 happens now from a fundamental affordability perspective how do things look not like what point is reading landscape uh, for for people now but how do we under, how do we take this new understanding of learning from and being in country in the context of this uh the the lack of accessibility to to legal ownership of of land moving forward what does that look like do you think now like what is what's a top line of errata to add to retro suburbia for for 2023 in a higher interest rate world and all the rest of it mm. well i think i mean i said earlier that um being connected in one place uh and uh coming from that rather than moving all the time, obviously is assisted by, by tenure, by ownership, by security, and the possibility of continuing connection. Uh, and that, yes, in the current context, is not something that's available to people. But in another way, it actually breaks the idea of connection to a parcel of land and takes us to actually the broader indigenous view of the whole of country that all of it is part of where we live and understanding all of it that's been part of my journey in permaculture from the beginning of of knowing where the um the, the wild fruit trees are that you can forage from uh, that knowing when is the season to go and uh, get something in the in the public commons um, and knowing whose places you know have particular qualities in everything from what is the uh, place where someone you might have some relationship with whether that is family or friends or or connections, what possibilities you may be able to enable or take benefit from in that place as opposed to this other place, which is, you know, on different country of a different nature. So all of those things of feeling in the whole landscape, in the way I said, coming to central Victoria and then coming to Dalesford and Hepburn, and then looking at, you know, where is one locating that that is sort of being part of a, a wider landscape. And 
it was then from Meliodora that one of the criteria here was our connection to the wider hinterland, the commons uh, around us. So whether we'd been uh, owners or whether we'd been in central Victoria generally, all of those connections would be important and, and valuable. And so there is that aspect of um, being nomadic um, of that uh, understanding country, reading landscape is actually a really critical skill uh, because by default, when we actually are in one place, we do end up learning a lot about what it's like because just stuff happens. <laughs> you know, so you, you learn from experience. <laughs> oh, yes, well, uh, whereas when you are somewhere new, when you are, arrive somewhere or there's some opportunity emerges to be somewhere, the whole reading landscape is is so central in the same way that it's reading community. What's the deal here? What's going on? What are the opportunities? What are the threats that one needs to move away from? And we talked about that in Retro Suburbia in terms of four uh, um, patterns of response of consolidating in a place one knows versus going to somewhere new uh, on one axis and on the other axis, the whole mu uh, how much we create our own world, retrofit or create something uh, fit for purpose, and how much we downsize and disown and adapt, flexibly respond, and th that creates these four different uh, spaces. And one of those is the the uh, mobile minimalism <laughs> so that reading landscape is actually absolutely core skill in that uh, for people in that space so i think that's um, uh, something that's important but i also think we still shouldn't regard that um, access to uh, uh, land as inevitably constrained in the future. But it's interesting you what you said about the house in Queenstown. Of course, that was one of the bases of retro suburbia, that the, the pattern of moving to small, less favourable country towns was in, and in some ways still is an opportunity of uh, value compared with the uh, going and getting somewhere in the country. And when we came to Meliodora, that was literally the case. There were the odd five-acre block available in rural areas, and they cost four times more than we paid for one hectare within the town. Yeah. You know, so that, that thing of recognising those... Uh, those opportunities and a lot of those opportunities relate to places that are perceived as economically and socially undesirable. And yeah. so in those landscapes, of course, it's absolutely essential to read the community, read the people, make the connections, see, ah, oh, this is actually a place we could, could live in spite of all uh, the limitations. And we've seen that a um, number of occasions in retro suburbia, projects that people have done in, in very apparently down and out uh, communities where those uh, real estate values have been, um, you know, much, much lower. But I think, you know, broadly the strategy that we were talking about of avoiding debt and not getting on the treadmill of enormous debt. I think that um, is still really true. And I think there will be a lot of tragedies for people as the, the interest rate squeeze and the whole 
debt cycle becomes uh, more difficult as we 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 said it would as we unwind this this project <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, i i that's really I, I really like the idea that it we can frame it as a freeing up of uh because that's always been yeah a freeing up if 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 property affordability property affordability in many respects has nothing to do with the capacity to, well it has nothing to do with the capacity to read landscape but if it frees you up to see country in which you dwell uh regardless of your uh, obligations to a bank in relation to the place. <laughs> I think yeah I think that's that's really cool and I also do like the idea because I, I I agree completely that um it's pattern recognition rather than it, you can call it investment but it's more pattern recognition of um the behaviors of human animals to to see something like a eleven thousand dollar house in Queenstown which if people listening to this most of them aren't in Tasmania uh it's it's not a desirable place to live. Yeah. The, the hills are beautiful because they're denuded um, from 19th century mining. It looks like the moor, and it's. I was there the, last year. It's improved somewhat, but um, you you when you pay that little, fixer upper extends to everything. And I think that's what you were saying. But that's actually the opportunity because if you can move into an area that is um, socioeconomically depressed and you can do things like a, a food share, well, you're actually restoring outside of um, your own piece of land so that's that's a, that's a really medicinal frame i think for people and it's just it's still following patterns so it, it this is where this is where the opportunity um speaking of dan that carol sanford would say that's the, the a nodal opportunity where are you going to get more energy out for your energy in and that's ne necessarily going to change as we move mm. but i that, you're correct like as the interest rates rise if people can duck the falling rubble of of modernity uh, around them there will inevitably be <laughs> uh, more affordable opportunities coming up mm. because that's on the other side of tragedy and that's the cycle so that's that's also true yeah just uh returning to the 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 project of the reading landscape film i i feel um uh a great sense of gratitude to dave ma the filmmaker after dan's tragic death last year how he not only stepped into uh dan's shoes as the the visionary uh, producer director uh, of of the film but brought his own skills as a filmmaker to create something that is in a sense quite risky because it's quite slow in some ways that, and you know there's that risk of oh no it's too long or too slow or um and i think some people uh said that they were surprised at the poetry that came through mm -hmm. Uh, from from the film uh, rather than just the the pragmatics and I think that's I would say that's true I, I thoroughly enjoyed it watching it last night and it was yeah I, I see what you mean about the poetry if that's the director's contribution to landscape right like if it, well on the one hand the film is practical we're learning from yeah. David Holmgren techniques for things like reading landscape but that must be combined with something more poetic, something more uplifting. It's lovely. It's a, he's done a really good job. Yeah, and obviously that is there in the material and in, in some of the things that, you know that several people said they expect. They were quite surprised and pleased that it wasn't too didactic. It's not a how-to film. No, you know, it's uh, not a seminar. <laughs> yeah, uh, and but I think. Yeah, Dave Ma really brought out uh, that through uh, through the editing and through the um, just the and of course the yeah his his work behind the the camera, even though he he said following me round <laughs> was <laughs> sometimes like uh, following a a dog on a scent. <laughs> <But, laughs> 
from a filmmaker's point of view, <laughs> trying to I'm sure. trying yeah. to uh, get the angles and everything. So that no, was really nice. Yeah, yeah. and um, the film as uh, was uh, Dan's intent and the uh, commitment uh, to the um, the people who contributed that it would be uh, freely available. People uh, can go. I can send a. Uh, a link to the news page on the, um, or you, you may have that on the Holmgren uh, design yeah. site where people can get uh, a link to see the film. It's still through that sort of private viewing uh, process, but at no uh, cost. Uh, that may have some implications for whether it can be in different film festivals, you know, if it, it sort of hasn't been shown in in, in uh, a sort of uh, public viewing. It was not shown in. publicly, so it's technically not being shown publicly. Yeah, but um, you just need the the password and the link to get to it to, yeah. to quote unquote show it privately. Yeah, that's lovely. I know that was definitely. It was nice to see. It's nice to see Dan again. Actually, that was a really good, it's a really good way of of, um, of doing that. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. He um, was a good guy, and it was. It's a nice kind of revisitation of uh, yeah of the things that he contributed to the world yep yeah definitely yeah. Nice. all right well mr holmgren once again uh, thank you so much for your time love talking to you uh, it's it's amazing and the film is fantastic uh, i really enjoyed it i really enjoyed well I, I learned things from it but i actually really enjoyed that opportunity to sit with well what is reading and what is landscape and 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 how and, and I continue to sit with that so yeah thank you so much oh thank you you and uh, good to connect again